So we work with, am I there? Check, okay, great, sorry. You can hear, I just can't. Uh, <laughs> So we work with pastors and teams day in and day out, and we hear a lot of the problems that our parishes are facing today. Uh, problems with personnel, with budgets, with parishioners, with loss, all these different types of things. And so I just know uh, what you all are facing. On top of this, we encounter a culture that can be very secular, very hostile, and we all feel that as well. We feel a lot of the secularism, the atheism, the humanism, the relativism. As Pope Benedict says, he says, we're moving towards a dictatorship of relativism, which does not recognize anything for, for certain, and which has its highest goal as one owns ego and one's own desires. We feel that in the culture today all the time. And I think for, for you all, and for me, when you're in this situation and you're in, you're in 2019 working in the church, you naturally ask yourself, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to react? What's the best way forward? And when I get into situations like this, I often like to look to the past. Mark Twain once said, history does not repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme. So I like to look back in history and say, who else has been in this type of situation? How did they react? What did they do? What options were before them? And I like to look at the Jewish people. You know, the Jewish people didn't face a dictatorship of relativism, but they faced many dictators. They were captured by the Babylonians, then the Assyrians, the Greeks, the Romans. And as they had dictators over them, as they had hostile people telling them what to do, a culture that really demanded that, that they lose their religion, that many people flee from the religion, give it up. They had different scandals with their own leaders. They had different options before them. And in the time of Jesus, after they had been conquered by all those people I mentioned before, Josephus, who's a Jewish historian in the time of Jesus, he said there were four main parties in the time of Jesus, four main reactions to a hostile culture, four main options. I'm going to give those to you because I think they're the options before us today that we often look at and we often choose as Catholics. History doesn't repeat itself, but it sure does rhyme. This is the way the Jews reacted. I think this is the way many Catholics can react today as well. The first option is this. It's, I call it the runaway option. Things get bad. Things get hard. And you say, I'm just I'm leaving it all behind. I'm just going to go somewhere else. We're just going to get out of the culture. This is what a group of people in Jesus' time did. They were called the Essenes. They ran out into the desert. They said, forget Jerusalem. Forget the temple. We're going to set up our own system because all of it's corrupt. And we're just going to live by ourselves. That's where the Dead Sea Scrolls come from. Out in the desert, they found the Dead Sea Scrolls in jars and caves by these communities that left Jerusalem. They left society. This is probably an option that most of us won't take. We don't run away, hide ourselves. But it is an option that some people do take today. Our second option, I like to call it the join them option. If you can't beat them, join them. If you can't beat them, join them. This is what the Sadducees in the time of Jesus' day did. They were leaders of the Jews, and many times they would just give in to the culture. They said, it's too hard. We're just going to give in. In order to have power, we're going to agree with the culture around us. We're going to do whatever they say. And so you see this in the Gospels many times. You know, when the wise men come and they tell King Herod that there's a new king of the Jews, right? There's this new power structure. There's this new culture. It says that not only was King Herod terrified, but also all of Jerusalem with him. Kind of an interesting line. It seems like a throwaway line, but it's interesting to note that it wasn't just King Herod that was afraid of a new king. It was the entire city that was afraid of a new king. They had all given themselves over to the Roman culture. Their jobs, their livelihood was given into giving up their religion to the power and the culture at bay. And they were afraid that an actual king of the Jews would be present. This is the join them option. We see this all the time in our Catholic church today. People that say, you know what, forget it. I'm just going to dive into the culture. I'm not going to go to mass anymore. I'm not going to raise my kids in the church anymore. I'm not going to have my kids baptized. I'm not going to get married in the church. We feel this on and on again, this join them option. The third option is the fight them option. Third option is the fight them option. I don't know about you, but... Um, 
this option comes to play a lot with some of my friends I have. They really love the faith. They want to live out the faith. But when they get into conversations with people, they get really hostile. They get really aggressive. They're not really charitable. They don't want to win souls. They just want to win arguments. They want to stuff truth down people's faces, right? You're like, you're so knowledgeable. You love Jesus so much. But it doesn't seem like you love people, right? This is in Jesus' day. There's a group of people called the Zealots. And they said, our option here when we face the Romans is to go out and use violence against them in order to get what uh, we want. That was the zealots. The fourth option, and it's the option <clears throat> available to us today, is to create an exclusive club. To create an exclusive club. This is the option in Jesus' day taken by the <clears throat> excuse me, Pharisees. The Pharisee says, let's live out our faith, but let's do it in a club. If you act like us, if you follow the law, then you can be around us. You can eat with us. But if not, you can't be with us. And many Catholics do this today. They say, I want to live out my faith, but if people don't look like me, if they don't act like me, then they can't be around me. I'm going to create my own exclusive club. Jesus comes into this situation, the same situation I think we have today, these same four options that are before us, and he says there's a fifth option. There's a fifth option. We don't have to run away. We don't have to join the culture. We don't have to fight the culture. And we don't have to create an exclusive club. We need to love the people in this culture. We need to go out and be missionaries for Jesus. I think the greatest depiction of this in the Gospels is the story of the prodigal son. It's the story that every Catholic knows very well. And I think it's really important to note, and people often forget, the context for the story of the prodigal son. So it's another small detail in the gospel that really means a lot. The story of the prodigal son starts in Luke 15 and verses 1 through 3 with the Pharisees in a conversation with Jesus. And in that conversation, the Pharisees, who had that exclusive club, right, that was the option that they were taking, he said, Jesus, why are you eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? Why are you eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? In other words, we have this exclusive club, and you can't eat and drink with people who aren't in it. Jesus, you look like a Pharisee. I'll talk about that more in a minute. But you do something different. You're not taking our option. You're eating with these people. You're going out to them. You're loving these people. Why are you doing that? And in response, Jesus tells three parables, the story of the, lost son, uh, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son. And the story of the prodigal son, or the story of the lost son, is actually a story the Pharisees knew really well. And they would tell this story, but it had a different ending. The Pharisees would tell this story, and they'd say, two sons of a father, the younger son leaves and goes off into the world, and when he comes back, in the story of the Pharisees, something different would happen than what we read in Luke 15. The Pharisees would often tell this story, and when the son would come back, what would happen is the community would get together, and they'd face that son, and they'd do something called the Kazaza ceremony. What a fun name, Kazaza, right? But it wasn't a very fun ceremony. The Kazaza ceremony. They would take a pot, and they'd fill it with rotten fruit. And in front of the entire community, they would smash that pot on the ground and they'd say to that son, you are like this pot in this community and we don't want to ever see you ever again. This is our exclusive club that follows the law and because you sold your inheritance and gave it to the Gentiles, you're one of them now in this culture, you don't belong here anymore. And they would cast him out of the village and the story of the prodigal son, the reason why the father runs, which is so undignified, it's not just because he loves the son, it's because he wants to protect the son from that ceremony and from that ending. He doesn't want anyone else in that community to get to that son first, to cast him aside. He wants to bring him back in. This is Jesus' option. This is what Jesus is calling us to do when we're faced with a culture that's hostile, when we're faced with a culture that's dismissive of our faith, we're not called to flee. 
We're not called to join them. We're not called to fight. And we're not called to an exclusive club. We're called to love and to be missionaries as well. Today we often call this in our church missionary discipleship. Missionary discipleship is the, the term today to live out Jesus' vision. Pope Francis, in his letter of Evangelium Gaudium, he says this about missionary discipleship. He says, in virtue of their baptism, all the members of the people of God have become missionary disciples. So all of us. He says, all the baptized, whatever their position in the church or level of instruction in the faith, are agents of evangelization. It would be insufficient to envision a plan of evangelization carried out by professionals while the rest of the faithful would simply be passive recipients. We are all called to be agents of evangelization, to live out Jesus' vision in the culture and to reach out to other people. And today I want to share with you three ways to become missionary disciples. Three ways to be missionary disciples. I think when many Catholics hear this call to be a missionary disciple, they think, how do I do that? That's such a high calling. It's such an ideal. It feels not always natural to us as Catholics. I want to live out what the church says. I'm, I'm baptized. I know I'm called to be an agent of evangelization, but what does that mean? In our talk this morning, I just want to share three ways that you can do that. My book is entitled, Called, Becoming an Everyday Disciple in a Post-Christian World, right? This post-Christian world that's relativistic, this hostile culture, but how do we do that in an everyday level? How do people like you and people like me pull that off? And today I want to share three ways to do that. And before we really, really dive in, I want to pray. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Jesus, what an opportunity you have before us. You've called us to live in this day and age and a hostile culture to our, our faith. I just thank you for all the men and women in this room that each day uh, carry, carry two burdens. One is uh, the burden by our culture that's placed upon them, and the other is to be your witness to other people despite all that and through all that. And I just pray that uh, you would guide my words this morning, that your spirit would be here with us to open our hearts and our minds for how we can be your disciples and share God's love with others. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. All right, so we're looking at three ways to be missionary disciples. Three ways to be missionary disciples. Way number one, way number one is to learn to follow. Our first way is going to be to learn to follow. You know, a lot of times we talk about missionary discipleship, we talk about discipleships, we read about the disciples and the Gospels, but I find often, uh, as Catholics, we don't know much about the way discipleship worked in Jesus' day. If we want to be disciples, if we're going to call ourselves Jesus' disciples, we probably should learn what it meant to be a disciple in the time of Jesus. So I want to introduce you to a little bit of the system of discipleship in the Jewish culture, the system of discipleship that was present in Jesus' day and, a, day and age. The first thing you need to know about the Jewish culture in Jesus' day is that everything, everything in their education system was surrounded by the scriptures. That was their education. When you went to school, and what it meant for you to go to school, it meant for you to study scripture. And so when you'd go off to school, they, they um, have this phrase in the Talmud. They would say, before the age of six, we don't teach a child. But once they reach the age of six, we stuff them with Torah like an ox. We just stuff them with scripture. Everything in our culture is built on the word of God. And we want to just give our people as much of the scripture so they can live it out in everything that they do. And so these kids, they'd be six years old, and they'd go off to school, right? They'd have like their lunchbox, you know, and they'd go down the street. And they'd, they'd meet with a, a rabbi. And they'd go to a school, it's called Bet Sefer. And in Bet Sefer, is called the house of the book. And as a six-year-old, you would begin to learn scripture. And how would you do that from the age of six to 10? You would memorize scripture. And in particular, you would memorize the, the Torah, meaning the first five books of the Bible. From the ages of six to 10, you would memorize Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Memorized by the age of 10. I have a 10-year-old son. <laughs> wow, that's incredible. 
But that was the task before them. That was their education. The scripture were that important that that's what they filled their hearts and minds with constantly. But in oral culture where you didn't have books, you didn't have movies, your brain could actually memorize things much better because that's all you had. That's all you had. And these kids, by the age of 10, could in fact memorize the first five books of the Bible. If you're the best of the best, you could memorize these books of the Bible. And if you're the best of the best, the rabbi, your school teacher, would say, all right, you can come up to the next level. If you've got enough memorized, if you're doing well enough, you can come up to the next school. And this next school is called Bet Talmud, or House of Learning. And House of Learning lasted from the ages of 10 to 14. And so when you'd go through Bet, Bet Talmud, you'd memorize the rest of the Jewish scriptures. All the books not included in the first five books of the Bible. One interesting note that I think is very interesting for Catholics, when you read the Magnificat and Luke, this amazing, amazing prayer by, by Mary, she quotes scripture all over the place. And if Mary's a 14-year-old girl, she had just memorized the rest of the Jewish scriptures. The reason why she's able to say those scriptures is because she knows them by heart. It's not just something the gospel writer's placing in there. It's not just something later on they said, let's see if Mary said these things. Mary knows the scriptures because she's been memorizing them. And most of the scriptures that Mary quotes are ones outside the first five books of the Bible, ones that she's been working on as a girl in Bet Talmud. If after the age of 14, after you've memorized the Jewish scriptures, if you were the best of the best, you would be asked to go to Bet Midrash. Bet Midrash. This was like the Ivy School League of their day. They would be called, and in Bet Midrash, you'd have a rabbi who'd help you interpret scripture. Not just to know it by heart, but to learn really how to understand the scriptures. And as you'd go along, they'd start asking you questions to see if you could make it to the next level. See if you could actually get into Bet Midrash. They'd ask you questions. These were like the GRE questions of their day. They'd say, now, and uh, Deuteronomy 17, how many times is the book of Habakkuk referenced? As a kid, you just pull up Deuteronomy 17 in your brain, and you'd just start going through it, and then you'd pull up Habakkuk, and you'd compare it to do, and you'd have to tell the rabbi the answer. Or they'd say, in the book of Genesis, how many times is the Hebrew word well used? And you just have to pull up Genesis and go through it in your mind and give that rabbi your answer. After all these tests and all these questions, the rabbi who is your teacher, if you didn't have what it took, if you weren't the best of the best, he'd say, oh, you know the Torah well, but go apply your trade. Go have babies and hope they grow up to be rabbis. But you, you can't follow me. But if you did have what it took, if the rabbi thought that you had what it took, if you, the rabbi thought that you could follow him, that you could be like him, he'd say the two words that every Jewish boy wanted to hear. The two words that every Jewish boy would want to hear, which is lek hakarai. Lek hakarai. Come and follow me. Come and and follow me. And those disciples of this rabbi would follow him everywhere. They were no longer in class. It was a lived experience. Wherever that rabbi went, they went right with him. Whatever that rabbi did, they did that too. They learned how the rabbi talked to people, how the rabbi taught scripture, how the rabbi washed his hands, how the rabbi uh, how the rabbi did anything, anything and everything. They lived their lives exactly as that rabbi did because they were in training themselves as disciples to become like that rabbi. There was a blessing in the Jewish culture, and it was this. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. In other words, that you would follow so closely behind your rabbi that the dust from his sandals would kick up behind him and as a disciple you were following so close behind him, you're right there learning from him that you would just be covered in his dust. Covered in his dust. Because you wanted to be 
like the rabbi. Now that we know a little bit about this system of discipleship, let's read the scriptures and see if anything comes alive for us. Let's read the scriptures and see if we see them a little bit differently. I want to read from Matthew 4. As Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to, him, to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two brothers, James, and the, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Amazing. Makes much more sense of the scriptures. First thing I want to note is what were these brothers doing when Jesus called them? They were fishing. They were fishing. They were plying their trade, weren't they? They were at some time told by a rabbi, you're not the best of the best. Go ply your trade, have babies, and hope that they become rabbis. Jesus is teaching us something here. Jesus is teaching us something here. Discipleship is not just for the best of the best, not just for elite professionals like Pope Francis was talking about. Discipleship is for everyone. And Jesus chooses disciples that are everyday people, not the best of the best, everyday people just like you and me to follow after him. Jesus rewrites the scripture on discipleship. And he's teaching us something very important there. The second thing, it makes so much more sense of why these disciples are so willing to throw their nets away. I don't know about you, but I've read that scripture before and you just think, who are these guys that they like? Just leave their dad and their boat. And I guess it's, it's Jesus. So it's like, wow, like you're the son of God. I'll just follow you. But like, these are normal everyday people. Like they're working a job. They're with their dad. Like it's a big deal to leave your dad. But in the light of what discipleship is, right? In light of their Jewish culture. In light of what the words lech hakarai meant. Those were the two most treasured words in all of Jew Judaism. That a rabbi would come to you and you weren't the best of the best. And that rabbi said, come follow me. I think you can be a rabbi. I think you can hold the most prominent position in all of Judaism. I think you can go to an Ivy League school, it would be like for them. Here's a D1 scholarship. That's what those words would like, these disciples. And so they said, I'm going to leave everything to do that. To follow after this rabbi so that maybe I can make it. That he believes that I have what it takes. And I think, brothers and sisters, for you and for me, it's amazing because at the end of his gospel, Jesus tells his disciples, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. All of us are called to follow after Jesus, our rabbi. And we have to ask ourselves how we can learn to follow him even more in our lives. If we're supposed to be disciples and to be a disciple meant to follow after our rabbi, to be covered in the dust, by him, so that we could be just like him. What does that mean for you and I on a daily basis? It means that we need to learn to follow him so much more closely. For us, I think it's, it's daily time in prayer, learning about our rabbi, learning how he treats people, learning how he talks to people, learning how he prays. We have to be great disciples. If he's calling us to be his disciples, to follow after him, we have to spend that time each day in prayer, saying, Lord, I'm your disciple. Teach me to be like you. We have to learn how to follow. If we need more help, and I think all of us do, then we need to find other disciples in our life, and we need to follow closely behind them and say, teach me to be like Jesus. You need to find someone that says, you go, how do you pray out loud? I want to learn how. Lead me, I'll follow. How do you read scriptures? How do you pray each day? I want to know. Teach me how to do that. If we want to be great disciples, the first way we're looking at is that we need to learn how to follow. We need to learn how to, how to follow. And we can do that through prayer each day. And we can do that by finding other people who know how to follow Jesus. 
and learning to do that. So that was our, our first way, our first way of learning how to be missionary disciples. Our second way, as we get deeper into being missionary disciples, our second way is to let go. Our second way is to let go. In Mark 10, 17 through 22, we have another story of discipleship. It's little, it works out a little bit different than the one we just read in Matthew 4. But again, it's so much fun. Once you know about discipleship, when you start reading the scriptures, they come alive in a whole new way. You start to understand them. In Mark 10, it goes like this. As Jesus was setting out for a journey, a man ran up to him and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your mother and father. And the young man said to him, Teacher, I have kept all of these since my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loving him, said to him, You lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. There's so much to this story. So much to this story. First, I think a lot of times we discredit this young man. We go, oh my gosh, he didn't follow Jesus. But he had a lot going for him, right? I mean, he comes to Jesus and he says, good teacher. Or in a different translation, good rabbi. Good rabbi, how do I get eternal life, right? He wants, he kneels at Jesus' feet and says, I want eternal life. It's a really good start to life, right? If you had a son or a daughter and they kneeled at Jesus' feet and said, I want eternal life, you'd be like, they're off to a good start. I bet this is going to end well, right? He also says that he's followed the commandments since his youth, right? This is a really great guy. This is a really great guy. And yet Jesus is inviting him to something more than just being a good guy. Jesus looks at him, and I love this line, he loves him. In love, he challenges this, this man. He says, you lack one thing. Go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Jesus is inviting this young man to follow him. He's saying, lack hakarai. What an amazing statement. He's not just saying, hey, I'm going on a trip. Like, do you want to go? No. No, we know, we know better now, right? He was asking the young man to be his disciple. He was telling this young man, I think you have what it takes to be a rabbi, to teach other people, to make other disciples as well. He was telling this young man the words he'd want to hear from his youth as he's kept the commandments. And he knows how important the scripture is to his life. This is what Jesus is inviting him to. And Jesus in love challenges the young man to give up the one thing he knows that's preventing this young man from truly following Jesus, which is his possessions. Which is his possessions. The rich man, the rich young man, turns Jesus down. Jesus down. Right? He has a chance to follow the greatest rabbi in the entire world. He didn't know fully that invitation. He has a chance to follow the greatest rabbi in the whole world. And it's because he didn't want to let go. It's because he didn't want to let go. And as we are disciples of Jesus, as we follow after him, whether you've dropped your nets, you said, Lord, I'm all yours, or whether you're still trying to figure out what you want to do, all of us will realize in our lives that we sell stuff that we're holding on to. Stuff that we're not letting go so that we can be a better disciple of Jesus. I want to read this passage once more. And I want to put ourselves into the story. I want to make ourselves into this rich young man and see what Jesus can tell us about what we need to let go. I'm going to read it again. I want to put you in the story. 
And I'm going to read it in present tense. We're going to use a little imaginative prayer here. All right, we're going to learn to think through the Gospels and see what Jesus might be telling us. So you're free to close your eyes if you want to imagine it. Whatever you'd like to do. As Jesus was setting out on his journey, you run up to him. You kneel before him and ask, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says to you, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud on your father and mother. And you say to him, Teacher, all of these I have kept from my youth. All right, that might not be true, okay? We just, you might not have kept the commandments since your youth. <laughs> just roll with the story a little bit here. Still place yourself in it. But Jesus turns to you, right? Imagine this with me. Draw you back in. Imagine this with me. Jesus turns to you. He looks at you. And in love, he says to you, you lack one thing. Give it up and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. What is keeping you from following after Jesus? What is keeping you from becoming his disciple? My brain sometimes works in, uh, in different ways. I think I'm wired differently, so I think of different things. But when I think of all this, I think of a, a kind of a popular cultural reference right now, which is a woman named Marie Kondo. Has anyone heard of Marie Kondo? <laughs> hey, a lot of laughs, some hands. Marie Kondo, for you the, who don't know, is a woman who has a book. It's called The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up, The Japanese Art of Declutter, Decluttering and Organizing. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you in a minute why these two things are related, Marie Kondo and discipleship, but don't worry. <laughs> Marie Kondo is Japanese. She came out with this book in 2014, and it sold millions and millions and millions of copies about tidying up, about cleaning your house, basically. And she just recently came out with a Netflix show, and it is huge. Like, if you go to Netflix right now, it's like one of the first things that pops up. It's like Marie Kondo, the joy of tidying up. You're like, why would I want to watch a show about people cleaning their houses? And yet people do. They think it's, like, amazing. And I'll be honest, I watch it with my wife. It is kind of amazing. <laughs> Marie is Japanese. She only knows Japanese. And she comes to Americans' houses, does not speak English. She has a translator who's also named Marie, which is a little bit odd, but this is what happens. <laughs> and they go through American people's houses, and they learn to clean their houses. And she has this whole like, system for it. And she's Taoist, so it's a different religion. And she does kind of things that are a little bit weird. Um, so what she does is like you'll go into a room and you'll go into someone's closet and she's like, all right, so grab all of your clothes and throw them on your bed. And for some people, like they don't even fit on their bed because they just have so much clothes. And Marie's like, okay. Marie, through her Marie, her translator says, what you want to do here is you're going to pick up each item, every single item that's on their bed, every single piece of clothing. You hold it up and you ask the question, does this item bring me joy? You ask that question to every single item. And if the answer is yes, then you keep it. You put it back in your closet. If the answer is no, you thank the item for its service. <laughs> and you put it in a pile to be given away. That's where Taoism, Taoism believes like in the animation of material objects. And so that's why you thank it for its service because it's like a, it's more than a thing. Anyways, I'm not going to get into Taoism today. <laughs> We've got enough of Judaism. And I love, I, I love this. It's kind of a fun question. And it really does help people. And she has a whole system. I'm not going to go into all of Marie Kondo. But she has a whole system for cleaning. But this question I think is really important. And the question I like to change it to is when we're disciples of Jesus, I think we need to hold up the things in our life and say, does this thing help me follow Jesus? Not does it bring me joy, that's the wrong question. But does this thing 
help me follow Jesus, if we're disciples of Jesus, if we're supposed to follow after him, if we're supposed to drop our nets and follow after him, if we're supposed to give away all of our riches to the poor and follow after him, right? This is, this is the gospel. This is discipleship. This is what Jesus is calling us all to. We've got to hold up the things in our life and say, does this thing help me follow Jesus? And if the answer is yes, then we should keep it in our lives. And if it's no, we should thank it for its service and let somebody else use it. Does this help me follow Jesus? We can hang, hold up the things in our life. We can hold up the TV shows that we watch, like Marie Kondo. <laughs> it apparently is helping me follow Jesus. We can hold up our phones and the social media that we can look at. We can hold, hold up the activities that we do, the money that we spend. When I give this talk to, to focus college students, I tell the girls, I say, what you should do is you should take your boyfriends and you should hold them up, <laughs> feet dangling, and say, do you help me follow Jesus? And if the answer is yes, you can keep them as your boyfriend. And the answer is no, you put them aside, you thank them for their service, and let somebody else use them. <laughs> but it's true for us as well as adults, not just with people with boyfriends and girlfriends. Brothers and sisters, when you're a disciple of Jesus, you've got to hold things up in your life and say, does this help me follow Jesus? And a mature disciple looks through their lives and if the answer is no, you say, I'm going to put it aside. I'm not going to be attached to that. Because the more we hold on to things that aren't of our Lord, the less we can follow after him. The more that the disciples grabbed onto their nets, they can't follow Jesus like that. The more that that rich young man held onto his possessions, he can't do that. To the degree that you're able to let go of these things in your life is the same degree that you're able to follow Jesus. It's a gospel truth. I'm going to say it again. To the degree that you're able to let go of these things in your life that don't help you follow Jesus is to the degree that you're able to be a disciple of him. Mature disciples let things go, no matter how hard it is. No matter if your possessions or your father's business or your entire lifestyle, he asks us to let go so that we can be his disciples. This Lent, there's a lot of uh, men going through something called Exodus 90. Anyone heard of Exodus 90? It's a crazy, yeah. <laughs> Is anybody doing Exodus 90 right now? Hey, hey. Exodus 90 is, is crazy. It's just nuts. I did it last year. In Exodus 90, it's, it's this whole idea that a lot of men in our culture are attached to things in our culture. We satisfy ourselves really easily with all of these things, and we don't even realize it. And if we want to be disciples of Jesus, we've got to let things go. So here's the regimen for Exodus 90. It lasts for 90 days. You get in a group of of guys, small group of guys to help you because it's going to be really hard. If you can, you get a spiritual director because it is that difficult. And here's the regimen that you follow. Each day you're supposed to get eight hours of sleep. That doesn't sound hard. It'll get hard. Don't worry. Eight hours of sleep, you're supposed to pray every day. And you're going to need those things because you're called each morning when you wake up to take a cold shower every single day. No warm showers, no snacks, no sweets, no alcohol, uh, on Wednesdays and Friday, you fast from meat and eat less. Um, trying to think what else you do. Am I missing anything? Exercise, Exercise on a regular basis. Social media. No social media. Yeah, no media whatsoever. So unless it's like praise and worship or music that draws you closer to, to our Lord, then you're not listening to it. You're not watching it. You're not looking at it. It's a big one. Unnecessary, unnecessary purchases. Unnecessary purchases. Yeah, anything over $100, you actually ask your group, can I buy this? Meet with your small group weekly. Uh, no televised That's right. Yep. How many, how many people do you think have done this? <laughs> Maybe 100 would buy into this? Maybe 200? 17,000 men are doing Exodus 90 this lit. 17,000 men. Brothers and sisters, do not be afraid to let go and to do something extreme for our Lord so that you can follow after him. Those men inspire me. These men, these men in this room inspire me. 
to the degree that we're able to let go of the things that we're attached to, and we're attached to far more things than we think. When you do Exodus 90, you go, I had no idea that I used that thing to fill that need. And that's not what a disciple of Jesus is supposed to do. I didn't realize that I relied on that thing for my happiness because Jesus is my happiness. And it points you right to looking at the Lord in the face and say, you are the solution to my life, not this stuff that I often put into my life. To the degree that we let go is the degree that we can follow Jesus. Do not be afraid to let go. Find that one thing, the one thing that Jesus is calling you, the one thing that maybe you've found in prayer. Maybe go back to those scriptures if you need more time. Put yourself as a rich young man and Mark 10 and say, Lord, what is that one thing that prevents me from being like you? What's that one thing that prevents me from being like you? The last way of learning to follow Jesus to be a missionary disciple is to build relationships with others. To build relationships with others. The first way was to follow after Jesus, to learn how to follow him, to spend time in prayer, to spend time following after others so we learn what it's like to be like Jesus. The second way was to give things up, drop our nets, give away our possessions, whatever it takes. And the third way is to build relationships. I want to start with a story on this one. It's during World War II in Poland. World War II in Poland was, uh, Poland was eventually occupied by the Nazis. And in Krakow, Poland, there's this parish. It was called St. Stanislaw. Now, at St. Stanislaw, they had 13 Salesian priests. But when the Nazi occupation came in, 11 of those priests were sent off to concentration camps. So here they had this big, dynamic parish with tons and tons of families. And instead of having 13, Teen priests to run it, they had two. They had two. And these priests turned to their congregation and said, we need help. We need help running this parish. There's no way we can run this parish with two priests. There's too many people. There's too many needs. We need people to step up. And I'm sure there was a lot of different people who stepped up during that time. But one man in particular stepped up. His name was Jan Taranowski. Now, Jan Taranowski was kind of an interesting guy. If Jan Taranowski was in your parish, you would not pick him to be probably a leader in your parish. He's definitely not the first person that you choose. You see, Jan uh, was an adult male. He was single at the time. He actually never married in his life. And he was a loner that didn't have very many friends. As an adult male, he lived with his mother. And um, he spent most of his time as a tailor. When he spoke, he often spoke very formally. People said he was like a walking catechism. I don't know about you, I don't typically hang around with people who are walking catechisms. They said he was eccentric and had a really high-pitched laugh. So it wasn't someone, he was kind of a, this, this loner guy that you wouldn't think would be a leader. But um, Jan also had a deep love of Jesus. Jan was a tailor and he had a lot of time to himself. And he would spend over four hours in prayer every single day. Day. His spiritual director said he was a, a spiritual alpinist. He just had this interior life that was much deeper than anyone else that he ever saw. And Jan in this situation as a follower, follower of Jesus said that I, I need to lead. I need to step up. I need to build relationships. And so um, the priest had a need with the young men in the parish. And Jan said, I, I, I can do that. I can help. And so he started forming what's called living rosary groups. And in these groups, you'd have 15 young men, and these men would meet on a weekly basis. And during the week, each one of these men represented a mystery of the rosary. At the time, there were only 15 mysteries of the rosary. Today, we have 20 because around the year 2002, 2001, John Paul II gave us the luminous mysteries to give us 20. But at this time, they only had 15. So that's why they had 15 members of their group. And so they would pray the rosary each day during the week, and they'd get together every week, and they'd talk about their faith and how they can live it out and how they can embody the mysteries of the rosary. They could be a living rosary group. And each one of these groups of 15 was led by a young man. And, and Jan Taranowski would do two things in leading these groups. One, he would lead each week those four men and invest in their lives. And the second thing he would do is he'd host all 60 men in his home once a month. Now, that might seem easy, but at the time, you couldn't meet in large groups. 
and Nazi-occupied Poland. Every time they got together, they were risking being arrested and being sent off to a concentration camp. But Jan said, these young men need the faith. And I'm called not just to run away, not just to be in an exclusive club, not just to fight the Nazis. I'm called to reach out, to build relationships, to be a missionary to these men. Over the years, at least 10 of the men in Jan's living rosary groups became priests. That's the effect that this man had. But there's so much more to the story because one of these 10 men was Carol Wotiwa, who became St. John Paul II. Jan's investment in these men made all the difference, and it completely changed the world. When I think of Jan's story, I'm like emotional thinking of Jan. He's an amazing man, if you read more about him. Um, uh, but the first thing is that I think we never know the impact that we can make. When Jan decided to, to do living rosary groups, he never knew what, what would happen. He never knew that he had a, a pope. John, a friend of John Paul II said, we'd never be priests if it weren't for Jan. Carol, Carol would have never become a priest. It was only through Jan, it was only through his deep prayer life that introduced us to all the spiritual masters that dove us deeper into Jesus that's why we became priests. Jan taught us how, and we never know the impact. Jan just had a, a, a situation in front of him, situations like we have. Maybe we're not in Nazi-occupied Poland, but gosh, we're living in an age where the church is very hard right now, where our culture is very difficult. And we all have opportunities in front of us. What opportunity can we take? We never know what the difference we can make. Second, Jan didn't let any of his weaknesses hold him back. Whenever we're called to, to reach out to other people, whenever we're called to be missionary disciples, I think each one of us, myself included, just go, I, Lord, you know all my deficiencies. You, all, you know all my, I'm not. You need to start naming the list, right? The story that you tell yourself. I can't do this. I can't do that. People won't listen. What difference will it make? I don't have time. This thing stands in my way. We make excuses. Jan didn't do that. I've got to think Jan knew that he was awkward, right? Jan, Jan knew that he was a social outcast. He wasn't cool. He wasn't, didn't fit in. Jan had every reason to say, I don't, I don't belong in front of these young men. They're going to make fun of me. They're going to think I'm stupid. But Jan didn't. He didn't stop any of this from helping him lead. And um, I just ask you to think, think about your own life with that as well. The stories that we tell ourselves the lies that we, we, we tell ourselves about what we're able to do and what we're not able to do. We've got to learn to reach out. Missionary disciples do not run away. They do not fight. They do not join the culture. And they do not form exclusive clubs. They go out to other people. They build relationships and call them to be disciples. If you want to be a missionary disciple, You've got to be a missionary. You've got to go out to other people. You can find that way to do that. One way in my own parish, you know, I've been a focused missionary for 11 years before, and I've I'm, I'm, I'm worked most of my time at our headquarters, and yet I still need to make disciples. I can't just uh, do that as a professional. Oh, I write Bible studies. I don't need to make, no. I've got to do that in my own parish. And um, it was really amazing. Uh, we led something called the Alpha Course in my parish. And Alpha Course is really Pretty simple in building relationships. It, the Alpha Course is uh, it started in the Anglican tradition, but it's used across all denominations. It's something that's um, endorsed by people like Father Mike Schmitz and Jeff Cavins and all sorts of folks uh, in the Catholic Church. And it's just a general introduction to Christianity. Very basic. That's a very basic question. Who's Jesus? Uh, what, what, why did he die on the cross? How does somebody pray? And it's whole, all designed to introduce a non-believer to Christianity in a very informal way. And so you get together and you eat a meal for 30 minutes. You watch a video for 20, 25 minutes with answering one of those questions. And you just sit down and say to the people in your group, what did you think? It couldn't be more simple. But, and I was just blown away by what the Lord was able to do. Not big, amazing stuff, but really small stuff in my groups. Things that people in the world wouldn't say are amazing. Things I'm not going to like write a news article about or tell the world but just when people, when you gather people, when you invite them to hear the gospel, 
whether they're far off from our Lord, whether they come to Mass occasionally, whether they come to Mass all the time, when you invite them to experience the gospel, all of a sudden you just saw changes happen. I had a couple that had just gotten married. They'd start to kind of go, oh, this parish is more interesting, more interested in my faith. And they went from people that attended Mass just occasionally to all of a sudden saying, we're all in. We're going to be disciples of Jesus. We're going to live out the church's teaching in its full. Before we thought, oh, it's good to go to Mass because we want to be good pe- people. They said, we're, we're all in. And we became uh, godparents of their daughter. These two, this couple went on to lead an Alpha course the next semester. There's a woman there who didn't go to church at all. And she'd call herself incredibly liberal in the culture. But she said, there's something about this Jesus guy I have to learn more about. And she came to the Alpha course and she said, I'm all in. And started going to RCIA. You never know what will happen when you take simple steps that are in front of you to build relationships and to be missionaries. To close, I want you to imagine a Catholic church where people really embrace their role to be missionary disciples. Imagine your parishes where people said, I want to be a missionary disciple. It's filled with people who followed after Jesus, who gave things up, who built relationships with other people. What difference that would make. How that would change the story of the people, not only in your parish, but also in the community around yourselves as well. Where is it going to start? It all starts with you and your commitment to missionary disciples. Don't let anything hold you back. Thanks so much. I want to give two quick announcements here as I close. The first one, my book was mentioned before, and I mentioned it again because um, we do have this high call on our church to be missionary disciples, but it's hard to do. The book is a five-week guide. I didn't see anything out there as far as a book to walk people through. It's just like, hey, there's this high ideal. Be a missionary disciple. Okay, how do I actually do that? So it's a day-by-day reflection. It gives you something to pray through for 35 days to encounter Jesus, to follow him, to understand evangelization. What does that look like? How do I do it? How do I live this out? just walks you right through that whole process. So there's some copies in the back. If you want one, they're available on Amazon as well. Um, The book is called Called. That way you can never forget its name. It's called Called, um, which is fun to say. So I just offer that to you, especially I know many of you are working in in parishes. And this this question comes up all the time, like, we need missionary disciples. How do we do this? That's why I wrote the book is to be able to do that. Yeah, quick question. The book is in Spanish also? The book is not in Spanish, no. Uh, it would be great if it, if it was. A lot of our focus Bible studies are in Spanish, and that's what I, I love. And um, I work with Amazing Parish. We do stuff in Spanish. But yeah, right now the book's not in Spanish. But you can write my publisher and tell them that you like it in Spanish. <laughs> Probably we're going to make a business. <laughs> <laughs> AveMariaPress.com. You can go and you can tell them. So, and if you want copies, they do like bulk distribution and things like that. So if you're like, hey, we want to give it away to our parish to be missionary disciples, uh, that can be facilitated. Uh, the second thing is the Amazing Parish. It was mentioned before, uh, work in there. It's just an awesome, awesome model for parishes. It really builds up leadership in a parish between a pastor and his team. We have conferences each year to help build those teams. And then we help parishes create a vision and clarity for what they want to do and really help enforce that. So we have conference coming up in Cincinnati in May, May 13th through 15th. And um, it really helps get the whole uh, uh, thing off and uh, uh, you get that, that team formed and off and running. And then we have free coaching after the conference to help you all throughout the process. And I'm out of time, so I'm not going to go through it now. But feel free to ask me questions. Uh, the Amazing Parish is doing just really incredible things to help parishes move from maintenance, maintenance to mission. If you want a, a parish that is on mission, that has missionary disciples, it starts with the leadership in your parish to say, all right, we're going to really overcome all the things that come at us in a parish. It's really hard. There's so much stuff. Again, we talk to to parishes and pastors all the time. There's so much stuff to prevent us from mission, and we feel like we're starting to unlock the code to get parishes on mission. We have our conference, as I mentioned, is coming up in Cincinnati in May. Today is the very last day to register, and I was talking to my team. We have a few more spots left, and we actually have two scholarships that we'd love to give away for free registration and free hotel rooms. 
So it would just be your flights if you wanted to go. So today's the last day. You need a pastor and your team to go. We can, if your pastor's on board, we can figure out the team later. But I just want to throw that out there. Um, if any of you were interested, uh, feel free to talk to me. I'll be, I'll be around uh, through the lunch hour, but I'll be leaving around 1230 after our panel. And um, just, just talk to me. So thanks so much again, and God bless.